I guess some of this information that you'll see on social media around um, individualization or personalization for women training you know, a certain way at a particular time of the month, maybe in the follicular phase of yeah. the cycle and then differently in the luteal phase. And yeah. if, if there isn't necessarily, I guess, strong evidence to support that, why are we seeing that? Is that a sexier story? Is that an easier way to, to sell something? I'm making you speculate. Yeah. But I'd be no. interested to kind of hear what I your I have lots of opinions is. on this. So there's, there's, I've, I've thought about this a lot. So I think it's coming from a few places. I think that some of it is the literature and the science and what we're seeing that is premature or very low effect size or very messy data at this time where there's some themes and patterns that we're seeing that I think, like, I, I think a lot of people take the camp on the antagonist of they're like, there's nothing changing, nothing's different, everything's the same, you're just like, like, there's, you're the same the entire month. And I'm like, well, there's a little bit of nuance and individuality to that. But I think on the hyper swing, a lot of it I think is a response to, I joke that it's a response to the way fitness industry has treated females, not actually sport or exercise science or health science has treated females, where for years there was this push of extreme hit, fat loss focused only, extreme cardio, like under eat, feed yourself, like push yourself, all pain, no gain. And I think that a lot of, you know, women were never taught that they can listen to their bodies and manage their, their pain and their stress or their tolerance and exercise training or auto-regulation, or they don't typically get sold or promoted well-balanced programs that balance intensity and volume in a way that's recoverable. And so when they find something like cycle syncing, they then find something that potentially brings them back below that threshold of either low energy availability or recoverability, or they're not burning the candle at both ends. And they, they do genuinely feel better. But what happens though on that side, I think is a hyper swing in response to that very early mid 2000s or last, you know, 20 years of that extremist where they, you know, want to kind of have that step back from that extremeness that we've always been sold because they're not, women aren't sold fitness like males are, but we also weren't ever sold fitness like athletes, where I think that some of those components are what make better fitness programs. But what happens though, is it becomes a secondhand game of telephone where everyone's communicating something that gets misconstrued along the way. Um, and it's just confusing. And now you have this, these cycle syncing protocols, but none of them are, none of them are the same. They're all different. They're, everyone's telling you to do a different thing at a different phase. And like, it's kind of made up. And what I think my frustrations with this side of it a lot of time is that they're, they're mad that we don't have enough data on women and that we need more data and that we're treated like males, but then we're, we're giving, we're giving women secondhand hypotheses as, as truth. And that frustrates me because you're not actually giving them anything credible, you're just saying, well, this might happen to this or this might happen here, so you should only train like this. And we don't have any data to say that you should only do Pilates or walk for 7, 10, 14 days of the month, but it's just, oh, it's inf it's inflammatory or it's not recoverable, so you should just kind of pull back and do nothing. And I think an issue there is that a lot of the people coming from that side of things, they don't have formal training in exercise science, sports science, exercise physiology, so they don't understand how good training programs kind of come about. So the solution is to just, well, you pull it all back. Right. Well, it's a very compelling story because yeah. there, are, there are anatomical mm -hmm. and physiological differences between men and women. Yeah. Right? So as you just said, hypothesis. Yeah. So of course there could be all sorts of hypotheses mm -hmm. That, that women are going to respond differently yeah. to training and perhaps at different times of the month, they respond differently again or different stages of their their life. Um, so I can see how, particularly for someone who doesn't feel like they're getting results, mm -hmm. that they would come across that information and it's a very compelling, strong Well, argument. it's a sexy story. You've been left out, you've been forgotten, you've been trained like a man, and I'm going to train you like the female that you are, and it's going to get you all these results, and it's going to work better for you. Most of the time, when it's good, it's just repackaged strength training with a pink bow, <laughs> if, if I'm being honest, or at the worst end is this work with your body, listen to your body type thing that I think people think is independent of what a good training program can also include. I'm just thinking about how someone might push back on this. Mm -hmm. right? No, if I've gotten all the pushback on this. Yeah. I, I think one thing that comes to mind is I think someone might say absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and you, what I heard earlier from you is you're not saying that there might be differences in terms of how women respond to exercise compared to men, mm -hmm. but we, we maybe we, we don't have 
the resolution right now with the current data to know what those differences are, mm-hmm. to be able to prescribe very different set of exercise recommendations for women. Yes. Um, but you are saying it is it could be possible. So there's two things I think that, I think people lump the menstrual cycle and sex differences into the same bucket. And there's sex differences, and then there's menstrual cycle differences. And right now, I think we have some stuff that is more clear on sex differences and how either we respond or adapt our potential or all of that stuff. And it's a little bit more clear. But what people want is that menstrual cycle difference. They want to know, should I train different in my follicular phase versus my luteal phase? And I think that there's going to be potentially spine fine-tuned variations that may come out more and more. And I I think people think that I'm very anti-cycle syncing in the sense that I'm not open to or excited to the literature growing as we go through the years. There's actually been a couple clinical trials pushed through that they're going to actually start trying to look at this a little bit more. And hopefully over the years, we can maybe have some more specific guidelines. But I don't think what will come of that is going to look like the current state of a lot of these claims around how you should train around your cycle. I think there's some variations of this that are definitely more refined and more data-driven and potentially better than some other forms of that out there. So it's not to say I'm against that, but I think right now we just don't have strong enough data to say you should only do X at this time or Y at this time. I think if anything, it's okay, maybe you you drive up this here and you drive this down here or you focus on recovery more here, but you're not changing every single week the routine or movement style or type of exercise that you're doing. And if anything, I think that complicates exercise for females even more. And I think that that ends up inadvertently adding a barrier to people who are already falling further below the exercise guidelines when we think about the gen pop and healthy populations. And I think that there might be a time and place for considering hormones, but it comes after all of these other steps and what we need to get to at that first. Because at the, t- at the time right now, the data is pretty much conclusive of, and it should be individualized. So it's not to say that your individual experience is invalid. It's that the cycle you have this month might not be the same as the cycle you have next month. And it's not the same cycle that your friend is having and your response and how that impacts you won't be exactly the same. And that's what makes it complicated. So I always like to say that I think that it's this, and I I sympathize greatly with this deep desire from women to want to, to have data and information about themselves, but it's not that they, they then in turn are wanting this one, one size fits all thing. But the reality is, is that you are so individual and unique that it's really still going to be based on you and your symptomology and your menstrual cycle experience because that's going to change. And I went to the female athlete conference last year and I saw some really interesting data from, I wish, I don't think it's published yet, but it was really neat where they tracked people's performance over two cycles and the phases that they performed better in changed cycle to cycle, even within the same person. And that's why I think this gets messy and complicated because it's not, you're not having the same exact cycle every single month for the rest of your life. Or, you know, your hormone levels or how you're sensitive to those compared to someone else might be different or your PMS symptoms might be different. So you might have a more detrimental impact of your cycle on your performance or your exercise training than someone else, but that means that it should adapt to you. Not everybody should be fed the same one-size-fits-all, 28-day, perfect Pinterest graphic meme version of how to train. Right. So does that come back to what you said earlier, listening to your body? Mm -hmm. Is that where this becomes important? Yeah. So I think that the reason this sells is because it's kind of giving, you know, women this permission to rest or take a rest day, or take a step back, or take it easy if they are feeling really terrible. And so autoregulation is something that's really common in the strength fields, especially coming from powerlifting and very more strength-focused individuals. But I think it's a really great tool that I think replaces cycle syncing in a way that allows people to have the tools to adjust their training based off how they feel. So autoregulation is essentially this, this skill or tool that you use the inputs of your day and your life and how you feel. Because I always like to say, you know, menstrual cycles might impact your performance in the gym or whatever you're doing, but you are more than just a menstrual cycle. You also have sleep and stress and your job or your kids or all these other inputs coming into your system, right? And all of that are going to affect how you feel any day showing up in the gym or your training sessions. And some days you might feel like absolute garbage or some days you might feel awesome, independent of the phase of the cycle that you're in from all these different factors coming into your life. But autoregulation essentially is a tool that says on a scale of one to 10, so rating of perceived exertion is often a scale that people use on a scale of one to 10, you know, you are you should go to this effort. And typically with strength training, it's like a seven to nine range. And then endurance training, it's like a four to a 10, depending on the day. But you can adjust the weight on the bar or the pace of what you're going or the effort of what you're going 
based on how you feel on any given day. And I think that accounts and captures a lot of things that might be changing within the cycle itself. And so to give more specific examples of that, you know, with the data we do have on the menstrual cycle, you may have better performance or strength outcomes in, in the follicular phase or late follicular phase, and you may have poor strength performance in that late luteal into that early follicular menstrual cycle phases. But if you use autoregulation, that doesn't mean you have to increase the weight every single week. It's, okay, well, this week you might go up, and this week you don't feel as great, so you go back five or 10 pounds, and the next week you go up. But over time, you're still able to make progress, but you're also working within how you feel, how fast the bar is moving, how hard you know your pace or effort is going, and you can adjust that based off how you feel. Um, and you can, and that's, you know, it's prescriptive to like, hey, work to this target. It doesn't matter what weight or what pace it is. It's how hard is that feeling? And I think that that's one of the, the most important tools that I think can allow people to kind of take ownership of their own cycle and their own symptomology and how they feel. And then also recognizing that, you know what, every single month on this day, I feel terrible and the last thing I want to do work out. And you have permission to just not train on that day. But that's not cycle syncing. That's just you know, adjusting your weekly schedule and program to accommodate for your symptoms. But I don't think that's cycle seeking in the sense of like, oh, you're only allowed to do this type of exercise on days X through Y, so to speak. Mm -hmm.